Hey friends, of all the over-explained and misunderstood concepts in music production, gain staging has to be the most ubiquitous. Everybody wants you to think that you're doing it wrong and that they alone are going to show you some magical key to a perfect mix. Instead of insulting your intelligence, I'll just quickly explain what gain staging is, then I'll show you a bunch of practical examples and tips you can use to get more of what you want out of your DAW. So this buzz phrase, gain staging, is simply feeding the right amount of signal into gain-dependent or non-linear audio effects to get the sound that you want. So what is a non-linear effect? Well, it's an effect that sounds different depending upon how much signal is going into it. For example, distortion, saturation, compression, limiting, bit crushing, amp simulators, envelope followers, and so on. These are all non-linear effects. These, as opposed to linear effects, which are chorus, flangers, phasers, reverbs, delays, and so on. Let's check out what I mean. Okay, so here we are in session view, and the reason I'm doing that is because I've taken this little guy and I've pulled this up so that we can look at the VU meters of each of the tracks. This is the, the level we can see right here. Now, a lot of people get confused. Right off the bat, this is not a gain control, okay? This is the output slider. This is the last thing that affects the signal in the entire signal chain, okay? This is how loud the track's output will be, okay? This is an output control. Now, if you look between each one of these processors, we have my synth right here, and then we have a bunch of different processors. We have the auto filter, utility, so on. You can see the gain between each one of these effects. Okay, so take a look. Now check this out, if I turn the slider all the way down, you can still see the gains or the levels between each one of these effect processors, right? That's the first thing to understand. This is an output control, okay? Now the next thing to understand is that utility right here, this device is the vehicle for gain adjustment in Ableton Live if the effect doesn't have its own input or output, okay? Watch this. I can turn this gain down right here and we can see there's signal here and signal here, but there's no signal here. I have to start turning it up. So anywhere where you don't have gain control within a track, you can simply slap a utility in there, and there's nothing wrong with turning it up or down, okay? So I know these are some pretty boring concepts, but that's just something to understand. Okay, so linear versus nonlinear effects. Chorus, like most modulation effects, are linear effects, meaning it doesn't matter how much gain you push into them, they won't change how they sound. So the way I'm going to demonstrate this is I'm going to grab a second utility and put it after the chorus, okay? What I'm then going to do is group all of these together, okay? Now that they're all in a group, I'm going to reveal the macros by clicking this little button, and we're going to map the gain, input and output gain, so that when I turn this gain up, this gain turns down the exact same amount, all right? So let's go ahead and map that. Mapping this first gain to this knob, and I'm mapping the second gain of the second utility to this knob, and I'm just going to invert them, okay? So that means that if I turn this any direction, watch this, the gain will go up in this one, and the gain will go down in this one, right? So let's go ahead and listen to what happens when I do this. We can hear that no matter what I do, no matter where I put this, it sounds exactly the same. That's because the gain is changing linearly, okay? Now, let's go ahead and do this again, but this time let's do it with a saturator, okay? So I'm gonna cut this chorus out, right? And I'm gonna put in a saturator. Now, I'm gonna turn the saturator on. Now listen to what happens as I change this gain. I'll put it back at as close to zero as I can get it. Okay, so starting from zero, now take a listen to this. At this moment, we're on the analog clip saturation mode, so take a listen. And now we can clearly see that there's more breakup, there's more harmonics in the signal, but what we can also see is that as I'm increasing gain and compensating for that gain over here, it's actually going down in level. We can see the RMS going down in level. Let's choose a different um, clipping algorithm. Let's choose medium curve. I'll go back to the middle, okay? And let's do it again. And so what we can clearly see is that saturator is a nonlinear effect. It sounds different and behaves different and outputs different levels depending upon how much gain is going into it, okay? Now, this is all very unnecessary, what I have here, okay? I can go ahead and ungroup this, all right? I can remove these utilities from here 
at this moment because guess what? Saturator itself has a drive and an output. Now, the thing to understand is that every single nonlinear effect has a different name for the same thing, okay? Sometimes it's gain, sometimes it's drive, but at the end of the day, this is an input level, okay? That's all that this is. Watch what happens as I turn this up. So it's low right now. This is representing the input signal. Thus far, it's been pretty linear, but once we start to get around this line right here, it's gonna start breaking up and it's gonna become nonlinear. Now you can hear that that's gotten pretty loud, right? I've put eight decibels of gain into the saturator. That's why there's also an output control. So I'm taking out, for example, eight decibels. And now when I AB this, we should relatively have about the same level. And we do. As you can see, the peak level is a bit higher when the saturator is off, but when the saturator is on, the RMS level is a little bit higher, right? Take a look. So that's the crucial thing to understand. There are linear effects and nonlinear effects. Now let's go ahead and take a look at a bunch of different examples where what you feed into nonlinear effects, as well as how you shape the signal, vastly changes the result. All right, let's check it out. So moving on to track two, this is just a drum beat. It's kind of a dirty drum beat, check it out. And here we have a saturator, and as you can see, our signal is going well up above the clipping line here, and we're on the medium curve setting. It's one of my favorite settings on saturator. Now, I have a compressor before the saturator, all right? First thing to know is that this is not always what you want to do. For some reason, people think that there is a specific order to effects every single time, and that is just not true, okay? Again, there is not a perfect recipe for anything in audio, okay? Especially with nonlinear effects. In this specific case, it makes sense to put a compressor before the saturator. Why? Because I need to shape the signal. Take a listen to what this saturator sounds like when the compressor is off. We can hear that the kit kind of sounds scratchy. It's just not that pleasing to listen to, right? With This is what, what it sounds like without any of the effects. Kind of dry and boring, right? I needed to spice the signal up a bit, and the saturator's doing a good job. However, it sounds scratchy when I turn it on. But listen to what happens when I turn on the glue compressor, okay? Listen to the difference. I'll go ahead and A-B it. Listen to how the compressor prepares the snare sound for going into the saturator. Listen to how different it sounds. Listen to how much more pleasing it is, right? That's because of the transient shaping that's happening with the compressor. There's a little bit of attack, letting a little bit of the initial snare splat through, but it's instantly pushing the signal down and then bringing it back up over this release time. So there is a nice shaping to the signal, and that is a non-linearity, okay? Depending upon how much gain is going into this compressor and then how much gain is coming out into the saturator, we have better signal. Now here's another thing to look at. If I were to turn this compressor on with the makeup gain turned down. This is an output control, okay? If I was to do that, what would happen is that the saturator would behave differently. Take a listen. See, I'm barely getting any breakup. So I need to have makeup gain here to make up for how much gain is being reduced every single time I hit this threshold. Listen. So you can see that even though the RMS level is almost the same level with the makeup gain all the way down versus when it's up, we're getting drastically different sounds. Hear how much more the saturator has to do with the signal when this makeup gain is up to where it was before. That's such a crucial thing to understand. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna turn the saturator off and let's just listen to the compressor. Now this compressor is sitting on a bus of tracks, right? There are multiple tracks, there's a kick drum, a snare drum, and so on, right? In this case, 
the snare drum is doing what I like to call challenging this compressor. The compressor, the snare drum is so loud compared to the rest of the drums that the compressor has to work harder to take care of that snare drum, okay? So this is another thing to understand when it comes to gain staging. I need to actually look at this snare drum and maybe turn the snare drum down a little bit. Check it out. Look how much more the needle is moving back whenever that snare drum hits. So if I go in here and I bring the snare drum down a little bit, take a listen. So with this setting, we're accomplishing more. The kick drum now has punch as well as the snare drum, and it all sounds a bit more balanced. Take a listen. So when you have a compressor on a group of tracks like this, it's very important to make sure they're balanced going into the compressor because it, again, is a non-linear effect and it relies so heavily on what you're, you're feeding into it. So I'll turn the saturator back on and I'll move on to the next track. Now, in this case, this is a bass line. Check it out. Now you might be looking at this and being like, what on earth? Why would you scoop so much of this body out of the bass? Well, in this mix, specifically in this mix, what I wanted to do was get a little bit more of the clicky top end of this bass line, right? But looking at this, you can see that I have an EQ before this compressor, okay? And so again, there is no magic order of effects. There is never a magic order of effects. This EQ, I might use an EQ after a compressor or I might use it before. In this case, let's explore why I'm using this EQ before this compressor, okay? I'm gonna turn the EQ off. Now look at how the compressor behaves when I do that. We can see that we're getting gain reduction all the way up to negative 10. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if that's what I'm going for, but with this EQ on like this, what's happening is that the bass is getting clamped down on so hard by the, the compressor that I'm not enjoying it, okay? And so what I'm thinking about here is I want the top end of this bass. I want the clickety sounds, right? That's what I want in this mix. So when I turn this EQ on, watch how much gain reduction we're getting. So we can see that we're getting about negative 5, negative 5.5 at the very most in our gain reduction, but the bass sounds more pleasing, it sounds more balanced, right? So as you can see, it's very important what you're feeding the compressor. So maybe the perception up until this point is that these nonlinear effects have perfect settings that there's some perfect threshold or input gain level on a compressor, and that once you get it right, you can save that preset and put it on any sound and get the same result. But you can clearly see in here that that's not true. How these effects sound can be completely different depending upon what you put into them. So in reality, getting good at gain staging means learning how these effects react to different types of signals that you feed into them, all right? Let's look at another example. So this bass move that I did might make a little bit more sense to you when you hear this other bass, and this is kind of supporting the lowest octave of the song. Take a listen. Now let's go ahead and I'll add this lead as well, and we'll listen to the whole track. Okay, so this next example might be a bit more advanced, but it's pretty simple once you understand what's going on. Right here I have a chorus going into an amp. And now amp is an amp simulator, so there's a lot of stuff going on under the hood. This is basically a saturator circuit, but you also have probably some compression in there, some different styles of EQ for the input and output stage. So it's a non-linear effect, okay? Now listen to this. I'm going to go ahead and solo this. This chorus also has a low cut. The reason that they put this control in here is that so when you are putting a lot of chorus on stuff and you're using high wet amounts, you're not putting the subs in the side channel, okay? This will focus the bass into the mids instead of on the sides, okay? So listen to what happens though as I crank this control up. Wait a minute, I thought chorus was a nonlinear effect. Well, it is. What's happening is that we're changing the signal character going into the amp. You can see that amp has a control here called dual mode, okay? When the output is in dual mode, it basically is making two amps, okay? And it's processing the left and the right signal separately. So when I change what is being fed into the mid or the side channel here, you can hear that the amp is reacting. So again, back down low, we get 
And as I crank it up, listen. Now, maybe that's more of what we're going for, okay? Now, another thing I want to point your attention to is over here. When you have a long list of nonlinear effects here, you can see all these effects I've got here. We've got amp and glue compressor, which are both nonlinear effects. When you have a whole stack of those in a row, and most of the time when you're making basses, um, especially if you're into EDM or that whole thing, you might have a long, long, long stack of these. If you go back to the very beginning over here onto the, the synth itself, you'll hear that these nonlinearities will have a much more drastic effect when you are starting to mess with the controls in the synth that's creating the original signal. Take a listen to what happens when I change the filter frequency. You can hear just how that tiny little move right there is very drastic on this whole thing, right? So real quick, if you're enjoying the video, you should check out my free webinar where I produce a track from start to finish in Ableton. The link is up here and in the description of the video. I'm sure you'll learn a lot, and you can also find out about my Ableton online courses. Between all three of these, there's 50 plus hours of hyper-focused Ableton content, which makes Seed to Stage, to my knowledge, the most robust Ableton course available on the internet. So go check out the link. I'm sure you'll be happy that you did. Anyway, let's get back to it. All right, so the last thing I want to look at is the master track. Okay, so let's go ahead and grab a limiter and let's try to get this track loud. So again, with all of these nonlinear effects, the limiter is also a nonlinear effect. As you can see, we have an input gain here and then the ceiling is the output gain. Basically, no matter how much signal I feed into this limiter, if it's doing its job, it should only output at the very most negative 0.3 decibels, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start cranking the, the audio into this limiter, and we're gonna crank it pretty hard because I wanna show you something, all right? So you can see that we've got some significant distortion here, okay? There's some significant pumping and distortion in this signal. Let's go ahead and we'll set a release time maybe to get a little bit of a smoother result. There we go. So this sounds a little bit smoother, but it's still got that pumping problem, right? There's a little bit less distortion uh, when I turned off the auto mode and turned the release down a bit. Okay, so how, what do we do about this? This is where you can use all the knowledge, hopefully, that you've gained up until this point to prepare this limiter for success, okay? You gotta you got set it up for success, right? So now, sometimes when you put a limiter on a track, you can start to hear what is challenging the limiter, what the, what the track is that's making that limiter clamp down so hard on the signal. And to me, it's this kind of mid-range bass, okay? I can hear that it's pretty much the loudest sound other than the snare and kick in this mix, right? Listen again. Right? So what I can do is I can go in here and I can say, all right, I need to turn this compressor down a bit. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so let's take a look at the limiter now that I've turned that down about 3 dB. Okay, we're getting somewhere. We can see that the limiter is now pushing the signal down a little bit less and it sounds a little better. Now something else we can do is take a look at this low end bass. Now this low end bass is making a lot of deep subs, right? So what I can do is I can take a look at this and I can see that there's some challenging happening here. So maybe one option I could do is I could turn down the subs of this low end bass. Now listen to how much smoother that is. Just that small move there, I still have relatively the same amount of what it sounds like low end, but cutting out some of that flabby kind of difficult to hear, just feel kind of low end bass, it sounds a little bit more tight, right? Now let's take a look at the limiter. Now we can see that the limiter is so much less challenged than it was before, but we need to do one more step. I'm gonna grab a glue compressor and put it before the limiter. 
Now, this is yet another way that you can work on gain staging. So how I wanna set this glue compressor up is that I want it to just catch those peaks, okay? The glue compressor is really great, as you saw before, at capturing very, very sharp peaks, okay? So what we can do is I can turn the attack all the way down, right? I'll turn the release kinda of down like this, and what we're gonna do is we're just gonna dig into the, the snare drum hits and anything that peaks out in volume, okay? Now check this out. As I turn this threshold down, we're gonna be able to clean up the sound of the limiter, listen. Now, I know that this is extreme, and there is still a tiny bit of distortion in that limiter, and it's still a bit of a pumpy mix, but I have it a little bit higher than I normally would just to illustrate this. But as you can see, hopefully this is a mind-blowing moment for you. You can see that the compressor is preparing the signal for the limiter, and the limiter is doing a much better job of making that gain get loud, okay? But it's not pumping. It doesn't sound as crappy as it did before, right? Now normally I'd probably have the gain down a little bit more in this and I'd have a little bit less of an extreme compressor setting, but yeah, as you can see, listen to the difference when I AB this. So as you can clearly hear and see, there's no one setting on any of these effects that will work every single time when it comes to non-linear effects. This is why I roll my eyes every single time I see compressor or saturator presets. It simply doesn't make any sense at all as each signal is unique. Since so much of how a non-linear effect behaves depends on the sound coming in, there can never be a single preset that would ever make sense for these type of effects. Now, I do understand presets for modulation effects as well as reverb and delays, because for the most part, these effects are linear effects, right? Cool. Hopefully you're feeling a bit wiser today. If you like this kind of thing, make sure you subscribe and hit the little bell. I'll see you next time, everybody. Take it easy.